everybody. Welcome to Build. I am your host, Ricky Camilleri, and our next guests are two of the stars of the Just in Time for Valentine's Day series reboot of the classic breakup movie, High Fidelity. This time, Zoe Kravitz plays the lovelorn record store owner, Rob, surrounded by new suitors like Jake Lacey, who's sitting here, and record store nerds like the one played by David H. Holmes, who's also sitting here. Please give them a round of applause. Jake Lacey and David H. Holmes. Let's hear it. Hey. I have to be the nerd, and he gets to be just this cool suitor. The new suitor. I was, trying to, I was trying to think of a different way of describing you when I when I wrote that a few minutes ago, right. and then he met me. He's like going hard with the nerd. I uh, double down on nerd. But there's no. I think people like record store no, nerd. As, I'm not but I don't think your character is that much of a, a nerd. I would actually say one of the big differences is that the two. If if you are if um, the woman is the Jack Black and I forgot who the actor's name is that plays the original character in in the movie they are far less socialized than it feels like your two characters are right right yeah right. they, they only had a, a the span of a movie to yeah. get those relationships fleshed out we get hours so well it seems like your character can carry on a conversation with people when they come in the room whereas in the previous one all he could do was sort of reference that's true records that's true. that he knew yeah um so I love this series. I watched all of it in one day. I was really surprised at how much I loved it because I do love the movie, and I was kind of nervous about where they were going to go with it, how it was going to work, but it's incredibly charming and works perfectly. I couldn't stop watching it. Uh, how did you guys get involved, and what did you think when you signed up to do the High Fidelity reboot? Were you fans of the movie? Were you as nerd trepidatious as I was going into watching it? I was a huge fan of the film. And uh, my involvement w really came about, like, there's no parallel character in the book or the film for who I play, but... Um, You're one of the few things that sort of go yeah. off. Yeah. And because, you know, like David said, we have 10 episodes here and um, potentially more in the future. And so there's room to, like, expand the world a little bit beyond what was initially there. Um, but I came to the project because... Jesse Peretz directed the pilot, and he and I had worked together on a couple things. And girls, uh, right? Girls. He direct, the first time we met, he did one episode of The Office, and I was like, "Do you live out here?" And he was like, "No, I, I live in New York." And and then girls, he was um, like director producer for the year that I was there. And then um, yeah, so he had floated my name to Veronica and Sarah and Zoe, and then we did a Skype, and then. Um, they sent me the script, and I flew out to LA, and we did a test, and then I was lucky enough to get to be a part of it. And um, it didn't occur to me until we were talking just moments ago that you were like, I was a little nervous about it, but it turned out great that people would be nervous about it. <laughs> like, I think for I think for different reasons too. Like, I was slightly nervous about it because I love the original movie, and I totally. think for a lot of people the movie doesn't hold up for them because it represents a certain maleness prior yes. to, you know, 2014, 2015. Yes. Uh, and so I think people are sort of nervous that it is in some way going to feel beholden to that, even though it's about a woman, which I don't think it does in, in any way whatsoever. Yeah, it's a pretty... <laughs> it's always fun to be a part of something, to think it's going well, and that you understand why it's going well. And then to see the final product and be like, oh, this is going better than I knew it was going. And in myriad ways that I wasn't aware of. You know, that like the ability for the writers and producers and Zoe to recontextualize this story into 2019, 2020 in a way that isn't just like... And the lead's a woman, so there you go, woke world. And it's also not working too hard to do it. that. Yeah, you know, that's to the naturally other part of seamlessly that. Yeah. create this world and this character is like awesome to witness that as a participant after the fact, to be like, that's that's incredibly well handled, yeah, <laughs> I and think. I, and I think Nick kind of put it, you know, more succinctly in, in that article that he wrote in Rolling Stone, but the the characters that he wrote, it doesn't need to be a man. Like, people fail at love all the time. You don't have to be a man to do that. Women can fail at love. Women, there's a messiness to these characters that it, it, you can be any gender, any race, and you're going to understand it. Everybody likes music. Everybody and has everyone heartbreak. Everyone likes music, and everyone knows how to, like, just trying to figure out how to love is completely universal, so... Yeah. Um, well, you said that uh, when you're on set, feeling that something is going right, what, is that, what does that feel like? Because I'm sure without naming anything, you've also been on set and been like, something's not going right here. I don't know how this is going to turn out. But if you, you had a sense that this was going to turn out pretty well. I think um, maybe like the 
clearest ex- expression of that in my experience is when like a script isn't working and you feel like as an actor maybe my job on set is to like mend this script into a passable scene Mm -hmm. instead of having a script that's good and then being able to do that scene well to tell that story which really is what you hope your job as an actor is not to go in and be like okay, yeah, we can cobble this into a good scene or a passable scene. And so um, that was my feeling on set, was being like, oh, these, the scenes I'm in, these are well-crafted, written scenes. They're being well-directed. I get to be opposite people I trust and enjoy spending time with and feel like this is collaborative and that we have the same vision for where it's going. Mm -hmm. And even then, there's been times where I'm like, this is going to be great. (laughs) <laughs> you see the end result and you're like, somewhere along the way, we screwed that up. You know, like it went off the rail somehow, even though I thought we had things where they needed to be. And so that to me is the the feeling on set here where I was like, I trust these people. I trust working with them. I like their eye. I like their, um, I don't feel like I'm fighting anything. I don't feel like I'm having to say like, isn't it this over here? Why is everybody talking about that? Like, this is the thing, right? right? And being on set and saying to Zoe or to the directors, whatever, to be like, this is the thing, right? This is what we're talking about. And everybody being like, yeah, that's that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing here. It's feeling like you're on the same page. Maybe that's the most roundabout way to say, like, you're on the that same page sense. with yeah. everyone, and it's a good page to be on. Mm. Uh, your character, I mean, one of the, uh, one of the ways that it, uh, is different from the novels that your character is gay. Um, and there is a wonderful episode in the middle of the season. I hope this isn't spoiling anything. Sorry, Hulu. Uh, where the episode is solely This about whole thing <laughs> shuts down on the internet the just like black. <laughs> wow, um, Hulu's got some pull. It's an entire uh, episode dedicated to your character's story and what his really relationships, I guess you could say, uh, are like. What was it like exploring that story? Because I've never seen that character that that character talked about. What I just appreciated about it, and I talked to the writers a lot, is, you know, the last thing that we wanted to do and that TV needs is that this cliched gay best friend. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to kind of fall into the tropes that have just been, you know, it's, it's just been done. So the the last... The, the least interesting thing about this character is his sexuality. Like, it's, and <clears throat> it, we, made it, we made a point to not make it a thing. Like, it's just, that's what I happen to be. So once I kind of got that out of my head, it, I wasn't worried about like playing something. It was just, I'm this person who has these troubles in life, who can't get along with, uh, who can't get along with anybody in the same way that, you know, she does. And, you know, you just worked it out. And so I didn't really have a difficult time with it. It was, um, yeah, it was a really fun episode to shoot. Yeah, I mean, it, his his sexuality isn't the most important thing in his life, but I do think what is interesting about that character is that he comes out a little bit later in life. For sure. Um, yeah. Especially, I mean, considering the time period, not that there's any sort of general specific point that people should or do come out. And also he is sort of, seems to be living in one world that feels primarily straight and his 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 queer life exists kind of separate For from sure. that yeah and i was wondering if you guys talked about that or, or no we didn't really talk about that it's again it was more just trying to find the best way to tell his story right mm-hmm. and and so yeah there was no real discussion on you know hiding certain things or not hiding it's just it's the same way that she can't find a relationship that works it's just you're trying to figure out how to love Mm-hmm. And you're not, and you're constantly failing. So it was more along those lines. If if we had any kind of discussions about it, how involved was uh, Nick with the with the show? I, behind the scenes, I think he was very involved. Oh, I, really? I never saw him on set, but I mean, he's an executive producer on it. I know him and Zoe, you know, workshopped a lot of scripts together. Wow. Um, I think he had a hand at writing some of it too. I mean, or helping out with little fixes here and there. And Zoe's a producer on the show, right? She is. Yes. What was like? What was that like uh, on set with her? God, she was just incredible. She's the hardest working woman in show business. No, wonderful because you feel like you have a champion that is like, yes, the hardest working woman to be sure because she's like one foot in this camp of like answering to our boss's boss's boss about 
where the show's going and the characters and casting and all these things. And at the same time, you feel like you have a champion on set where you're saying like, does this make any sense? Why are we doing it this way? And she's like, I totally agree. And it's not just two actors bitching about being like, that's a bad shot, right? Like, why would you, sh <laughs> all right, let's do it. But someone that can be like, yeah, this isn't great. Can we, sh can we shoot this differently? And then they shoot it differently and you're like, hey, all right. Like that feeling is incredible. Or to like call her and be like, what happens in this scene? Why does this and then that? And she's like, I'll take a look and we'll fix it. And then we were in really, and you're like, really safe hands with her. Like you it's just, awesome. yeah, you felt like you had an ally mm. <clears throat> who wants to make the best show and totally understood. Like if we did have an issue or a problem or like, I just don't think this is working. She's like, yeah, you're right. Let's change it. Let's do, let's fix it. She was, it's all about just making the best show possible. So, also yeah. uh, that her eye and sense is um, fantastic. So I feel like there's a lot of times, myself included, that, that people can be like, here's what's not working. And it's rare that people can also offer like, here's how it could work, right? That it's easy to just point out issues and that part of her, I don't know, gift as a producer on this was to be like, here's why this isn't great and it should be more this. Like, pull it this way, which, um, I think she has great taste, or at least everything that she wanted to pull it toward, I was like, yeah, 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 let's do more of that. Let's get it weirder over here, you know? Um, like a good example is you having a standalone episode. I feel like there's probably people who are stars and producers on their own show who are like, I'm, I'm the star. I don't want to do an episode where I'm not the star. What are you talking about? It's my show. I'm not going to do that but was like, this is great. We should do more weird stuff like this. We should give more people things like that, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I I you're trying to prepare. He's, he's really, it seems like more people for a standalone. Like like that sounds right? like vaguely like a pitch to get his. Season. Yeah, <laughs> just maybe Clyde he has his one. own. He got in a standalone, why God, can't he? Yeah, like? God, maybe it's a three it episode a, thing. Zoe is not watching this, okay? It's fine. He's not yeah, watching. not watching this. It could be a standalone where we explore like how he loves Dave Matthews Band or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. or Fish, which I actually enjoy. He's deep into Mo. Don't get this guy started on Fish. OAR, you know? OAR, I'm not watching that episode. <laughs> Sorry, Fish, Pearl Jam, you know the other ones. DMV, I could I handle. OAR went I'm to out. Farm Aid, and I met two girls who were like 21, and they were like, "We're here for Dave," and I was like, "Dave who?" And they were like, "Dave Matthews." I was like, "That's great." And they were like, "We just got off tour with him," and I was like, "You're touring? Like you followed Dave Matthews for the summer?" It's weird to be of an age where like an act I saw in high school and college because it was current is now like a nostalgia act. It's like when I was going to see the Allman Brothers and my parents were like, really? I saw them in 1974. Wait, these like, girls were young? These girls were like 21 years old oh, who had wow. just spent the summer touring following Dave Matthews. And I was like, oh, we're living different lives. I'm. This is a fun nostalgia thing for you to go on tour in the way that people toured with the dead in 1993. And you're like, well. Well, they became one of those bands, right? Where like people tour, like. They came back around. Pearl Jam kind of became one of those bands yes. as well that people follow around and tour with and fish. It's really yes. fish and the dead though that are That's the really two. Fish. Like, Maybe OAR, I don't know. <laughs> I've never, I don't actually have ever heard OAR. OAR's at home right now being like, quit dragging me, man. <laughs> Huge build fans, OAR. <laughs> Not <laughs> anymore, <laughs> dude. Not anymore. <laughs> I've, I've lost my OAR fan base. <laughs> Just tearing it right down the middle. Um, did you guys think of a lot of the show and the movie is about lists and, you know, top five albums, top five songs. Did you think about what those things were for you or for your characters? Clyde does not consider those things, which is part of what Clyde's world is, is that he's like, yeah, that's fine with me. You know, like, isn't a guy who's like, this is fun to delineate my taste into these categories and these modes. And well, he kind of doesn't care about taste in a way. Yeah, that this from the book and then the film and then our show as well. But to say like um, that Rob's held belief along with Simon and Cherise being it's not what you are like that matters. It's what you like mm -hmm. that matters. And that for me, Clyde is actually the opposite of that being like it actually doesn't matter what you like it matters what you're like so for me there is no top for Clyde there's no like top five list of things hmm. that's my answer yeah and that's where I live personally like I know the character would have a lot of top five lists I just it's so hard to categorize that kind of stuff for me hmm. I just never been able to do it 
Your character, though, did you were you given a top five list of his uh, of his stuff or his interests? We mostly hear him listening to punk, at least in the episode. Right, right. Um, what? Well, yeah, I brought a lot of that punk rock in. I loved that when I when I came to my first fitting, I was wearing a GBH shirt, and they were like, "Oh, we gotta use that. Let's see how much, how much that stuff we can clear." My, I think I got the the audition. I mean, I got the the gig because at the audition I wore a Minor Threat t shirt. So punk rock is definitely a big part of... Is that intentional, of, or were you just wearing a minor... Did you well, think it is, this would help me? It is my shirt, and I do love that band. Um, but I was like, of course it's going to help me. It's like I work in a record store. Right. You know? Like, if, you know, advice to all actors, if, you know, know the character. If it's, if it's a, if you're auditioning for a guy that works in a record store, you know, put on a band t-shirt, you know? Chumba Wumba, whatever. Chumba whatever. Or a Chumba Wumba shirt. Yeah. You wore your or shirt, actually. No, he, I wore, he my wore a 311. Sold. Please, 311. <laughs> Amber is the color of my energy, yeah, yeah, yeah. guys. Shit. Yeah. What can I say? Like a late period 311, too, like when they were covering The Cure and that was all over I modern rock. All right with 311? Period. I've never right. heard that. Oh, no. It was all over modern rock radio for like three years. Their cover of, I want to say, Love Song, maybe. Um, is it any good? No, God, no. <laughs> Garbage. Like, just listen to love. Sorry, so- just yeah. listen to The Cure. What are we doing? Yeah, you don't want to <laughs> hear the sort of, like, white reggae take on love song. At least I don't want to hear that. You know what I really need? Who is, so, uh, excuse me for forgetting her name, the woman who plays the other uh, record store employee. Divine. Divine, yes, Divine Joy Randolph. She's incredible. Yeah. Uh, what was it like working with her? Incredible, because she's just so... She's like a tiger. Like, if you put, like, a wild animal on stage, like, she's just so in the moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, was kind of leading these, you know, they let us kind of go off script a little bit just so that we could all find our chemistry, find our kind of, you know, find the room so it doesn't look scripted and staged. And she is the absolute best partner for something like that. Like, when you've done the scene, you've done it exactly the way it's written, and they're like, okay, play around with it. I mean, she is unstoppable. She's so goddamn funny. And again, in the moment, and you just, you, you can't not feel connected when you're working with her. So, yeah, I loved it. Did you even have any scenes with her? There's one scene where I come in to the shop. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and then when I leave, she is like, who's that dude in khakis? And Rob's like, he wasn't wearing khakis. And she's like, no, but a guy like that kind of is always in khakis. You know what I mean? Metaphorical khakis? Like yeah, metaphorical khakis. Um, yeah, that was so I only get a hard though. stare from her. <laughs> that was the the most it's kind of her thing. Yeah, she's great. But you have a scene with um, uh, a wonderful cameo in the series. Yeah. Uh, Parker Posey yes. makes an appearance. What was it like working with her? Wonderful. I mean, she plays um, uh, a rather eccentric artist living on the Upper Parker West Side. Character. But also, like, she was so wonderfully protective of that, right? Like, I think she... <sighs> yeah, I'm speaking for her, but I'll just say that I think, like, she does uh, um, this thing wonderfully well that other people do, and it looks a little like they're making fun of an eccentric, or they're making fun of someone who has fully committed to their own path, right? And Parker does it in a way that feels really vulnerable and fun and true to this character's life. And so there was a little bit of her being like, please don't give the note of like, do it weirder, you know what I mean? Where she's like, that's kind of rude to <laughs> this character because this character isn't like, I'm a weirdo. Right. And... She's also an incredible, like, architect within these scenes where there's, like, this whole thing written out, and it seems like she's grabbing these pieces from somewhere else, but you're like, oh, you're so tuned into what this needs to be and are, like, building this thing as we witness it, you know? Like, didn't come in to be like, here's how I want to do it, but is like then this will happen and then I'll, I can come up the stairs and come back down and then go back up again and is like finding it and molding it and early on you're like, is this gonna work? What's happening here? And then 10 minutes in you're like, oh, you're a genius. This is <laughs> remarkable. And, um, and also just always so thrilling to have loved a person's work for a long time and then meet them and work with them and like that's the coolest thing. Fanning of the chicken wing in, uh, waiting, 
waiting for Guffman. She's like oh, fanning oh. the chicken wing <laughs> yes. out in front of the. Eh, it's classic. It's just I love her. He's a genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nobody fans a chicken wing. And to watch <laughs> that <laughs> genius like occur, in a way that's like controlled chaos was lovely. Yeah, I had a great time with her. I always remember her in Best in Show going, working on my MacBook. <laughs> What's the dumbest thing? <laughs> Find his busy bee. Yeah. They have braces. Oh. <laughs> yeah, she's really good. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple of questions from the audience. The first one is from Juan right here. Hey. Hello. Hi, David. Um, I oh. want to know, um, what's your process like as an actor from like your audition to like then you get the job and then actually being on set? Um, like process specifically? Yeah, what like, do you do? As an actor. Well, I mean, it's talking about process is always so difficult because it's like, it's kind of one of those things, it's it's hard to talk about. But to answer your question, if you get an audition, learn every line. Learn everything you can about the character. Go in off book and just be completely confident. Doesn't mean you're going to get the role. That, you, you, thousands of them you won't get. But, uh, but be confident. Learn your lines. And then when you get on set, just don't screw up. <laughs> just be a professional. Like, just work with people. Be open, and and come out of your trailer on time, and you're going to be aces. Thank you. That's best good. I know it's kind of not exactly what you wanted, but that's as about as close as I can get to talking about process. Know your lines and come out of your trailer on time. Yeah, I mean that's about right. Yeah, and people pay thousands of dollars to go to school. <laughs> Crazy. There it's you about seventy percent of the job, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. right. Um, next question from Melissa. Hi there. Um, I guess it's a question for uh, sorry, for both of you. Um, were there any specific reasons why you accepted this uh, job, and what was the? Were there any differences between filming with a series versus like a cinematic environment? Uh, I mean, I accepted the job because I did not want to be a bartender anymore. I was the, the 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 night before the audition. It's like 3 a.m. and I'm running lines with my regulars, and I'm like, God, please let this be the one. Um, so there's running that. Running lines with your regulars in the bar. <clears throat> yeah. What no. bar did you work at? Union Street. Well, the one that I worked at, I've worked in a few of the years, but the one I worked at last was called Union Street Pub in Crown Heights, not far from where we shot most of the series, which was kind of very satisfying. Being able to shoot in a neighborhood I live in, in a neighborhood I've worked in for years, but um. When I mean, you booked the gig, did you tell all the regulars that you got the gig, or did you just not go back? No, no, I had to, I had to go back. I still had to make money, you know. It, yeah. I booked the gig, and then it took a few months before we started shooting. But, uh, but yeah, certainly the bar, sh the four a.m. bar shifts were a lot more fun after that, <laughs> knowing that the end was near. You can only be a bartender for so long. Yeah, every bartender knows that. My answer is, I. Um, The reality is is like one foot in um, the kind of boring and one foot in the creative, which is um, I love High Fidelity, the book and the film, and was a fan of Zoe's work, and I liked the script, and I liked the director, and um, there was just a couple of us that went out and tested, and then I was thrilled to be asked to be a part of it, you know? And uh, creatively was like, oh, there's room here to do something that I will be hopefully proud of and fulfilled by. Um, and then the other thing is like, I live here and it shot here uh, in my neighborhood half the time. And um, I got a couple of kids and like didn't want to be going out to LA for a thing. And, and to like have all that come together into one package is the greatest. Like I couldn't have asked for more. So some of it is is creatively like I, I was excited to be a part of this because of the material. And the other part is just logistics of like, oh, the feeling to like go to work and then sleep in your own bed at night is unparalleled when you're used to like traveling for work and being in Airbnbs and trying to figure out how this all works for your life here when you're gone for weeks or months, you know? And then the comparison between like uh, cinema and, and a series, I think, in my experience, is just um, depends on the size, really, of every production at this point. It's like I've worked on movies with very little money, and so you're really scraping it together and trying to move fast and shoot quick and like get this done in three to four weeks. And then there's other movies that have a ton of money that you're kind of like, are we just spinning our 
wheels here. Like, let's go. This is taking forever, and it doesn't feel like we're doing much. And this is somewhere in the middle where it's like you're moving fast, but there's money behind it, and Hulu was generous in the way that they funded the production and gave us what we needed. And so... I mean, the music licensing alone. Holy is cow, insane. man. Like, it's I, crazy. I could not believe... Some of the songs that were that they were able to use. He had this. to forfeit his entire salary. <laughs> they I came to him. They're like they're wringing their hands. They're like, "Look, we yeah. can either Only have your salary or the <laughs> yes, just for the Bowie." You just hear one like, "I can't get now." They don't even get through the thing, and that was my that's your Mick Jagger cut. That's my Mick Jagger. That's my Bob you Dylan sound like cover. Eighty-eight oh, years old. <laughs> I can't get now. But uh, not, even the, not even the song licensing, but also I imagine you have to license all of the. Uh, Record jackets in the background and everything like that. Actually, I don't think you do. Really? I think so. Our, our our prop person was saying something to that effect. Like, oh, wow. for some reason, it's like public domain. Like, there's certain things that are public domain that like you can film without it. I can't remember exactly how it broke down. Like, if it's for sale, like if it's something that you would sell anyway, then it's fine. Okay. I, I can't. Also, remember. wonder if it's no. like featured versus screen time. Like, if you. Like, we feature Man Who Sold the World right. album cover. It's like, I wonder if we had to pay money to exclusively talk about that and have it on camera, as opposed to, like, bins of records mm -hmm. is, like, something separate. I don't know. Um, yeah, the music... I, yeah. I was, I was in a movie where they specifically mentioned Ella Fitzgerald, and then the production company was pushing to have someone cover Ella Fitzgerald for the scene. And the director was like, but it's Ella Fitzgerald. Like, there's not a cover for Ella Fitzgerald. It's either Ella Fitzgerald or it's not. And they talk about it in the scene. Like, quit nickel and diming me on this thing. Right. And Hulu was never like, do you have a Nick Drake cover? Could we get, like, a Muzak version of Nick Drake? They were just like, great, here's the, yes, here's the money Maybe for the Wonder thing. Wonder or David Bowie. It's yeah, crazy. is there a, like, karaoke kind of quack, 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 quack of Stevie Wonder. You want to get Stevie Wonder. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, guys, I love the show. Congratulations. Thank you very it much. It premieres very much. Uh, this Friday. Uh, you told me Hulu's dropping all of the episodes at once, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, binge it. Yeah, binge it. I did. I watched it in a day. It's fantastic. Everybody give uh, David and Jake a huge round of applause for being here. Let's hear Thank it. Thank you. Thank you.